sure. I put them on the wall. Okay. Okay. Reactions from anything anyone wants to raise? Readings you're doing or things you've seen in the press? A fun fact that uh, I didn't mention last class about Eddie Burke, because yes. we were talking about him and Trump, is that Burke and Trump, are act, as it happens, are personal friends. Uh, so? Burke is actually Trump's uh, tax attorney. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, I mean they're I mean they're actually like per both professional and personal friends. Wow! How about that? Never heard that before. The deal. Yeah. I I read that um, Trump has contributed to something like. A majority of the states in the United States had, had received contributions from Trump to the state's attorney, uh, either the state or city city versions of the state's attorney. So when you're a young attorney and you want to look for some business. <laughs> They were, they were called the two Eddies at the time, were Eddie Burke and Eddie Vredoliak. And Vredoliak had and has a huge law firm, advertises on the freeway and so forth. And the, the, old, the old Chicago neighborhood for steel, um, steel, steel plant. And, um, He, he hired, for instance, one student from here. He put him through law, an African-American. He paid for his law school uh, tuition, etc. And he's worked for Burke for his, his whole career. But we've got some very interesting combinations of themes, which we, his name was, it was Barak, his name was Barak Obama. Um, anyway. I've learned a lot from students. One guy was a first year grad student and he, he, he tried out for the New York Jets and they hired 50 guys and he was 51st. So he, would, he said, I, you know, I should have been a Jet but I didn't make it so I'm getting a PhD here. <laughs> but we used to run together. <laughs> and, he, he, and he would coach me on my running. When I, when, I, when I needed help, a little, a little bit we've been chatting about. <laughs> don't hurt yourself and don't do too much. Work on form, not speed. <laughs> Etc. Okay. Um, we're almost there. Okay, um, we are in, are we on here now? Yes. Okay, uh, we're in 
a section on entrepreneurial urban politics. Um, mostly the mayors, but the general idea of entrepreneurial mayors. Why do we distinguish between entrepreneurial and not so entrepreneurial mayors? The concept we introduced in a book called City Money is the invisible mayor, the invisible leader. It's an analog to Adam Smith's. What's the, what's the comparable concept and how does it apply here that you can see based on what you've read if you've only read five pages, whatever it is, of Adam Smith for this course? Uh, the, the term, I think, is used by Adam Smith himself, but certainly is applied to what he's discussed. And the ideal, the invisible market or the invisible business, the invisible businessman is Adam Smith's market, where we have a smooth intersection of supply and demand. They match as they will in the long term. And we supply enough shoes, red shoes, blue shoes, high shoes, running shoes, and the prices and what people can pay for are such that they're clearing the market smoothly and there's zero impact by the business because the market responds to the, what the citizens want. What's the analog of the invisible politician? If we go back to the first section of this course, we read Sassen and the others have said, but if we look at Sassen building on Adam Smith, the, the idea then as well of um, <coughs> Paul Peterson we've I've mentioned is really the, in his book City Limits stresses the, the um, uh <coughs> um, market via competition among cities. And the competition can be both for residents who can move to or away from a city, or between the leaders who may be for providing policies, whose policies may be attracting or repelling residents and voters and others around, including lobbyists. And if we think of a model where the mayor has a big impact and may in some cities and in others has zero impact, that's an invisible mayor and an invisible politician. And it relates to the concept which we also introduced in conjunction with the, the, the label we used at the time was um, was um, <coughs> um, the new fiscal populist. So last session, Monday, we talked about the idea of two competing policy perspectives. People who want it, I mean, the classic right, we want to have lower taxes. I said the classic, I shouldn't say too far classic. Let's say the, the Manchester liberal conservative view is low taxes, efficient um, distribution of services because the government should give you what the people want, whereas the strong leader is, I have a good idea of making a lot of the world and our mayor, our life better for me as mayor, the mayor thus has an impact. And the, and the politician, if the, and so, the classic way that these kinds of things would be implemented would be through a strong party. And this is the non-US situation relatively more compelling with the weaker party systems here. But in, in England, where even, even England, where they have a lot of democracy, but not for the parties, especially local parties, the whips choose the mayoral and the ci all the city council candidates. So it's hierarchically dominated by the political system 
in ways that it's not, that was true in Chicago in the good old days of Mir Daly, one. <coughs> um, so the term which has exploded with Trump and others in Brazil, Philippines, elsewhere, is populism, which comes back more historically to the late 19th century when it was, was used. But the idea that the citizen should be the driver is the term populist in, in, each, in, the, in the main economic and political senses that I've, I've introduced here. Uh, <coughs> the, the, the idea of, um, so I want to, I'll, I'll draw from, I mean, I use these big concepts I've introduced because they, they connect the big themes, well, the way, the way we did so on Monday. We said if, if, if the, the four kinds of politics that, that many people have discussed, for instance, other, um, left, right, ethnic, and this new fiscal populist, also called or rebaptized as new political culture, who are fiscally conservative, and socially liberal. They combine the left and the right in ways that don't fit the normal parties. And therefore, usually the parties are weak. So Obama, Barack Obama, when he ran for president, he said, I'm not gonna run, especially in Chicago, for instance. I don't wanna help from you guys who were the Democratic Party. I'm gonna build our own organization. We're gonna call them Democrats. We're gonna work, we're, we'll use the same name as you, but we're gonna build the organization and we want lots of little contributions because I don't wanna owe anything to anybody. That at least was his, was his, was his style. <coughs> and that, that fits with the, at least the populist appeal. Uh, <coughs> and so the, um, um, uh, of, appeal in the sense of I want to give citizens what the citizens want, not what the party tells you you should have. So the, the, um, the second threefold classification of big types of politics, I, I've sort of taken, I don't know, I won't take for granted, I'm telling you now very explicitly. <coughs> Ancient, very old, is really patronage. You have a boss, such as a slave owner in the American South or in Afghanistan today. We have, we have um, militias and heads of militias. We have people in a, in a traditional geographic domain. They may own the horses or the cars or the guns or the, uh, <coughs> and more money. Uh, they build organizations and violence is a, is a serious part of, of what they do. In the American South, the followers of one, one plantation owner would, would march and fight together in, in, a, in a branch of the Confederate, Confederate Army. <coughs> um, people died together. The, the, um, and their children, and their, if the father was killed, would be normal that the next generation, and perhaps multiple generations, would be continued to be. Just, okay, so that, Patronage is the, the classic old form of politics around the world and was visible and clear when Mayor Daley won, was asked why he gave those contracts to, sons, to his son's insurance firm. At least his official answer was father's duty to help his sons. Uh, he didn't say, as the mayor, first African American, mayor, populist, developed a new approach, although his, he, he ran for mayor twice before he ran for mayor and then won the nomination in the election. His own father had been part of the traditional Democratic Party. So the old traditional Democratic patronage, client, clientelism, exchanges of jobs, favors, contracts, votes, is the classic series of private goods exchange, not the clean air, not fighting a war, which are the public goods of Samuelson. Instead, what people are 
which are good for building a coalition that you give some to people who join the coalition and you don't let the others who are there. And or, you, or you could say, if you think you want to be a NATO member and you don't want to pay, okay. That's the background of the private good <coughs> thinking. <coughs> the, um, the, the, um, Second simple form of politics, which is mostly what most of you as USC students were what we discussed on Monday when I asked questions. Most, most people most of the time talk about public goods for the big, for big policies. And this is what, what's also been termed a public good or a, an, a um, um, <coughs> policy voter kind of model where you have no serious intermediary like a political party or a person who gives you favors. That is, you, you read the newspaper, you think about, you want to choose the best issues, and you vote for that. And therefore, that's an, uh, <coughs> a couple of, couple of different names of that. I won't, I won't try to put one on, on it. But the classic it, 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 in the paper I did called The Irish Ethic and the Spirit of Patronage, those two, the traditional model of patronage is legitimated by an, at the local level by Irish Catholic, more generally Catholics tended to be, have been stronger historically in those areas, those neighborhoods, those cities, than in, than in areas with Protestants who, who tend, tended more in the direction of Protestants of Jews and toward, toward the abstract views of um, justice and so forth, those kinds of terms. Not who gave it to me. Uh, my, my due, it's my turn. Uh, <coughs> the the um, um, the combination of these is what we get with this new political culture. We can have both abstract issues and private, private and public. We can have a combination of both lobbyists and voters. Uh, and bureaucrats, each pressing toward policies. And um, Yasha, did you have your hand up? No, no, no okay. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, let me introduce quickly a, a, a in terms of the second reading here. Trees and row violins, building post-industrial Chicago. Chicago's the most studied city in the world, traditionally, historically. All kinds of books, papers, lots of people said this is really how Chicago works. And <coughs> um, the most dominant, at least, was, it, was, was that its politics was central, that the machine, the, the strong Democratic Party, strongest in the US, really explained where and how authority and decisions were made. Uh, exchanges of favors, etc. Um, when Harold Washington was running in the Democratic Party primary, he'd been drafted. He, he was the most visible, successful elected black official. He'd been in the state state um, state House of Representatives. He'd been U.S. House of Representatives nationally. He, he was willing to give up being a House of Representative, <coughs> a representative in the House, and instead to run to, 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 to serve as mayor of Chicago. When he started to give his first speeches, he didn't say much that was new. His main speechwriter was named Bill Grimshaw, who was also with his wife Jackie, the campaign managers of Harold Washington. And then he gave a speech on the North Side, and he mentioned We've got to really reform this city, which is really doing bad stuff. And the crowd said, yeah, let's change this. Thing. OK, a little bit like elsewhere. <laughs> and Harold said, hey, he said, Bill, you've got to bring this word in, reform. And he said, but Bill, what the hell does reform mean? He didn't know what it meant at all. <laughs> OK, so, so the. In a few weeks, he became a reformer. It really worked well. He didn't, he didn't lie. He just, he didn't know about it. He learned it in the 
campaign process responding to the applause, but the main point was this was the main center of his policy as mayor. He, and he, he had directly attacked the, re the regular Democratic Party organization, top and bottom, left and right, and when he was asked by the press, what are you gonna do about some corruption we just found in your administration? I will fire him and we will use every law in the book to make sure that he is punished to the maximum extent of the law. The opposite of what Mayor Daley, one, would have said and did say. In fact, the rules of the game were drastically changed by Harold Washington. When Mayor Daley, two, the son of Mayor Daley, one, many people said, you know, they both they, they look the same, they both speak Chicago Public School English, they wear the same suits, uh, etc. But when there was a celebration, I think the, maybe the 10th, the 10th anniversary after the death of Harold Washington, Daly, Daly too gave a speech and said, I took my program from Harold, from Harold. He also gave another speech or, or talk, Daly too did on campus for an hour. It's called Politics in the Family. And at the end, he gave, he gave his talk, and he said he had said nothing about learning anything about politics from his father. The first question was, didn't you learn anything about politics? Said, Absolutely not. Politics is dirty. We never discuss that in the family. These are very different conceptions of, of new, these, these come back to Elizabeth. Elazar's conception of moralism and reform drives corruption and patronage is immoral. Not only bad or illegal, immoral. You'll go to hell. You know, it's, and you talk about it with the family in church and in politics and in voting and in the, and in the press. Whereas if you're dealing with deals, you don't talk about who, who got what out of the deal. Those are private. It's dirty, so-called. And, or the press will call it corruption. Okay, corruption, clientelism if you're talking at the American Political Science Association. <coughs> the, the, um, uh, how could or did Chicago change its rules of the game? We have, we have, in the book called The New Political Culture, roughly 20 propositions of where and why and how we get this big transformation. And I pointed out, not only in the US, Western Europe, most citizens say the same thing. Japan, uh, where they had lots of surveys. Most citizens want low taxes and better services. How can we do it? Productivity improvement. It's hard to do, but at least that's the program of what most citizens want. But do the parties and the actual leaders or in their, in their speeches or in what they try to do, do they seriously do productivity? Some yes, and there are some people of this sort that we talked about, the visible names we see, Bill, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. Yes, absolutely. Um, lots of mayors, some, some, but many, many don't. Clearly we've got traditional right, traditional left, traditionally we've got ethnic politics, et cetera. And we've got every, every what shape, color, form, size of these in, in, in our politics today, surrounding this national, state, and local. The, the um, um, how more specifically, in bigger terms, has Chicago changed from daily one to present? Daily one was elected in 1955. So we're talking about the last, you know, the last half of the 20th century and the next 20 years, you know, almost 75 years. Daley One was, was, was mayor for a little over 20 years and had the most impact, but he continued the neighborhood ethnic nationalist backgrounds of as the most visible symbol marker of, this, of identity and voting. <coughs> but the specific ways that you could 
build a coalition with many different, 50 different aldermen, may, maybe not 50, but many different ethnic combinations represented there, you want to give them a little bit, and then you want votes and contracts back. Um, or you give them co contracts and, 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 and money, and you get the votes back, and, or the, the lobbying and the organized volunteers who, who contribute maybe 10% of their salary to the Democratic Party, which you use for good purposes, as you know from Eddie Burke. <laughs> okay, so the, the um, um, how might that change? So Harold Washington was elected, he's, reform he's a reformer, what's he gonna do? Bill Morris, I'll just mention one other example nearby, who was, who was elected about that, or in, or roughly the time of Daly, too. <coughs> uh, Waukegan is similar to Chicago in terms of its socioeconomic makeup. African American, Mexican, middle, middle income, uh, white Catholics, and a certain number of, certain number of African Americans. But the, the, um, and the politics had a strong machine. Uh, smaller city, small, but it nevertheless was big stuff. This is, I'm, I'm mentioning Waukegan because it's a more extreme version of what Harold Washington faced. Bill Morris, and I'll, I'll bring him in here because he, he's, he was glo he's important globally now. <laughs> um, he had, he'd gone to, to um, study journalism and as a BA, he, for his BA, he, he had a talk show uh, regularly on politics. Um, around Illinois, but especially the, the, the north, northwest side. Um, and he was very articulate, very smart, creative, and in interpreting stuff. And when he was say roughly, say, 27, 28, something like that, he ran for um, state representative, and he won. So he was elected as the youngest rep member of the, of, the state, of the Illinois State <coughs> House. And he then, in the, in the four years roughly he was there, he had the highest ranking of anyone in of all of these, of all the state elected officials in their voting record in favor of the classic left democratic positions. Um, and <coughs> no one else was, 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 was close, was, well, one other was close, but basically, uh, that was his politics. Democratic Party, similar, similar, similar nationally. This, this was, you know, not that long after, after Lyndon Johnson. Still strong Democratic Party. After about three or four years in the county, he decided he'd run for mayor. He thought about it. He'd explore the idea. So he went around and he knocked on the doors, one by one by one. He's going to fight this machine. How could he run, run against this machine that controls the city? He knocked on the doors one by one. He said, hi, I'm Bill Morris, I'm going to run for mayor. Uh, what's on your mind, what, what can we do? He said, lower taxes, next door. Lower taxes, next one, lower taxes. Are, are you, are, what party, he says, well, I'm Democrat. Democrat, Democrat, lower taxes, look. They're Democrats, they want lower taxes. Some are Polish, some are German, some are Irish, some are, you know, Mexican, they're all Democrats, but they want lower taxes. Hey, I never heard of that in Springfield. So I, I started, I, st I got in touch with him somehow. He, he, well, we, we were doing some field work, we had a student, we started to talk with him. And, said, and so I, I said, you know, this is happening elsewhere across the, he said, tell me about that. So we started going to meetings together, and, I found, and so I, I mentioned last time Diane Feinstein, Koch in New York as mayor, uh, <coughs> Houston, Kathy Whitmire. These three mayors were the most visibly nationally, but Bill Morris was doing the same thing sooner, well, and uh, let me add Peter Flaherty <coughs> in Pittsburgh. They all were doing the same thing, which was lower taxes, social left issues. And Productivity, following the law, not clientelism. And by virtue of doing that, you'd have a lot of money left to spend. 
and you could lower the taxes and provide better services. Um, we both worked together quite a bit with the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Washington. Um, the the um, just one one quick sentence on that linking. Well, this is this course is called Global Local Politics. Of how do we connect globally with what we get down locally? The the uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and this links then to the next book on the reading by James Norquist, who was the mayor of Milwaukee. Okay, his predecessors, mayor of Milwaukee, were big players in the U.S. Conference of Mayors. They lobbied hard for more money. They wanted part of the, the classic Democratic um, left. They wanted more subsidies, and they didn't care where the, where the taxes were raised, but if they weren't in our city, fine. But Milwaukee wanted, wanted more funding. <coughs> the, um, we put on uh, a number of workshops for them. Uh, well, let me back up. The, the, the policy of the Conference of Mayors was classic left Democrats, basically. Um, <coughs> Republican repars sort of, sort of left out. The, um, uh, they weren't active through the organization and its major lobbying efforts. Although they would still back the individual mayor, but they would try to get the, the mayors to work as a group. Um, so, for instance, Saturday they would, or see, Thursday, Friday, they talk, they talk, they lobby, they meet with a, with a, with a congressman, a senator, senator. They may Saturday they might they might make a a um, public relations statement to the. Um, uh, <coughs> press, and then the next day they would meet privately. Maybe a dozen, 20, 15, 10, 15, 20 mayors would be together. That's where I'd be involved with Bill Barnes. And then, then they would say, you know, why don't we try to improve productivity? And the mayor of Yonkers, for instance, or say that the mayor of mayor Palo Alto would say, you know, the way we solve this is to have have a new consultant who would help us develop a new way of combining a budget in this way. And so the, the mayor of Yonkers said, you know, how can I get someone from from you know from that kind of budget for my for my city? Because I can't do anything I want. I'm just oppressed by you know people who want this. I can't do anything. And he would use those words, I can't do anything. The other mayors, again and again in meetings like this, the other mayors would say, you don't deserve to be mayor. So what you say depends on the audience and changes, okay. How much, whatever, but I'll, 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 make, I'll get to the point. I mean, one, one way of looking at this is, is to say, <coughs> One way to measure an invisible mayor is to build a statistical model where we have, you know, 10, ten causes for why people vote for the left, three for the right, or how they get different kinds of policies such as higher spending in a city government budget. Where and why do we have higher spending? What are the factors? Higher income, education, so forth and so forth. Then, how much impact is there? Is there any impact added to that by the mayor? by the mayor's own policies, and we've had surveys of, of mayors who said, please, in the, for the, <coughs> how much would you as mayor in these following 15 issue areas, would you prefer to spend more or less or same spending on a 10 point scale? So we measure the fiscal, the fiscal, policy, fiscal policy preferences and the social policy preferences in terms of abortion, in terms of uh, sex education in schools and so forth. So we measure, measure those and then see how much impact of the, the, the views, one, the policy statements of the mayor and the council, those two, and then weight them by how powerful the mayor is based on the law, because the legal, some, some mayors are so-called strong mayors. The mayor has a veto over the city council, the mayor has, a, has the right to do this, or to appoint, appoint more numbers of people in the, in the, in the, in the government, whereas a weak, a weak mayor, can't do anything. It's the, it's the city council has to do everything, and the, and the weak mayor. And this is instead, there's usually a strong manager. So a city manager is classically there instead of 
a strong maritime city. And it's, it's even required, for instance, in the state of California, where it used to be. <coughs> the, um, so the, the sense of um, where and how we get policies influenced by the mayor, we can measure as I've just described. And when we've done this, if we find the path from the mayor the mayor's policy preferences and the mayor's legal authority, if that impact is zero, we then say the mayor is invisible. The mayor doesn't add any value or subtract any, anything in terms of spending. And there, are, and there are a certain number of mayors by that. <coughs> um, the, the, the question then is where and why do we get these kinds of differences and how do these connect with the different layout mayoral leadership. And this is the next reading called Trees and Row Violins, which is really how did Chicago politics change? And so I mentioned one theoretical answer is 20 propositions of abstract boxes and arrows, but we then pursue the same ideas in Chicago. And that's what we do here. And that, this is what I've, I've basically done for many years try to take one or two cases you really know well and then try to link them back to a more general a more general theory. So to balance Chicago and working through, I was then working through the, well, just to finish the Conference of Mayors story. The, the Conference of Mayors had, had, uh, had no staff. It was a lobbying group. It just politic, classic lobbying group. In the, in a, certain period, roughly the late 60s, early 70s, the, the, um, the um, U.S. Congress created a whole new group of staff that did research and analysis of anything that was, was pending legislation for the national government. And they, and they, and they would, you know, they'd say, you know, what, what, what's the best kind of research, analysis, evidence? They, they brought together the the um, the R and D in a sense for the for the for the, for the, the House uh, <coughs> and uh, senators and we'd come to hearings and, and so we we get a report from the um, from 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 these folks. Okay, when the when this group started making these reports and advising the Congress and then the U S Conference of Mayors would walk in and say, we need more money. So why? What would you use it for? Um, what sort of evidence do you have that, that you really could use it effectively? We might burn with the cities. Okay, and so that didn't that didn't that didn't impress the people who were doing the analysis. That, you know, show us that your city's really going to burn if you're going to cut cut taxes. So I mean, that is at that point, the staff and the leadership of the conference of mayors said, "Hey, we got to have some staff. Or we got to have at least some advisors." who could say something besides the city's gonna burn. So they, they went out and they had about 100 people who were usually in universities, and we all started coming to conferences together. They invited you know, people working on cities. We were talking with each other. And, and with a, we had little big and little conferences all around the country with the mayors and these advisors. And then after about two or three years, there were only four of us left. And I, I was one of the four with with David Birch at MIT, we really discovered the small firm really was the driver of the economy. 66% of small, 66% uh, of jobs, new jobs in the US are created by firms with 20 or fewer employees. Remember that, join that with Adam Smith. It's the small entrepreneurial firms that are the drivers. It is not General Motors uh, <coughs> and the like. And so, um, The second one was from Syracuse, and he was public administration, unions, lobbying, labor. And the, the, the fourth was a guy from a politician from, from New Jersey who was uh, in, the, in the House of Representatives. Okay, so those, those, we would then, we would talk, you know, or I'd talk individually three or four times a week, and I'd be in Washington three times a month, two or three times a month on these kinds, of, either in Washington or where meetings that were held with the conference of mayors anywhere, anywhere in the country. 
Okay, through that, we then, I then get, that get, gave me a sense of at least some of the range of the different styles of different mayors. And so I got a lot of invitations from people to consult with them for a fee and so forth. So I, so I turned them all down, unless there were people I could really learn from and generalize from that individual city and that mayor. But I, ch I chose to try to get one of each of some, some of the big types. So I worked with Republicans, I worked with Democrats, I worked with ethnic politicians, and these, and these new political culture people. So I, and so we would not just have, you know, meet them once, I wouldn't just come in and say, I'd like to give you some questions, you know, we didn't know. No, you've got to work with them. You've got to get to know person, as personal friends so you can trust each other. Or they're, they're, they, won't, they won't tell you anything, they'll lie. Everybody lies, or at least they, they don't know any better. <laughs> or they, they don't really know how to answer it. So, <laughs> if you get, and so many dinners, many drinks, many discussions, etc. Then you get a feel for how these four or more political cultures interpenetrate how people differently act and think and write books uh, to try to understand these things. <coughs> okay, so I'm passing this on as advice to you. Try to push yourself to get to know some people you act or politically engaged. If you want to go to law school, don't just talk out, talk with people who have your same views. <laughs> and you'll understand better <laughs> the world we live in. Okay. And it's deliberately to feel uncomfortable with some people some of the time. That's, that's life. Um, how did Chicago change? Consistent, or that, let's say, how could Chicago change in ways that we could link with internationally and with the kinds of propositions we have linked with social science and the new political culture book. <coughs> we have four, roughly four types, but the, the, the simplify and daily one, we have the classic Democratic Party perspective, um, socially conservative, slightly racist, maybe quietly, but at least uh, accepting, that is, you, 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 well, let me qualify. Both daily and the traditional view was we allocate jobs and contracts to each alderman, sorry, each of the wards via the ward party committeeman, not the mayor, not, that is not the mayor, not the alderman, but the party allocates the patronage jobs and contracts. How much does each ward or each precinct within each ward get? And the classic answer is, you will get a proportion, you will get an, an amount proportionate to the amount of votes that you generate. So Milton Rakoff, who was a very, very smart and probably wrote the best, best book on, on Chicago, Traditional Politics, R-A-K-O-V-E, <coughs> and the, the title of the book was based on an interview with a classic uh, Italian uh, traditional scientist politician, city council member in Chicago. And um, uh, <coughs> uh, and they said, what was, what was the secret that you were successful for so many, so many, so many uh, terms? Don't back no, don't, don't, keep, keep back your friends, don't back no, help your friends, don't back no losers, basically. Um, work with the people who are there, but give them private goods and hope to get private goods back. Uh, <coughs> the, um, um, he did a second book, I just, again, again get the, the titles are wonderful. He was then a, a first year law school student here at the USC. A Mikva, who went to the Hyde Park Democratic Party organization, said, "You know, I'm, I'd really like to to um, to work for the party. Can I can I volunteer my time and, and 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 work with you?" And they and they said, "Who sent you?" And the first and the and the and the and the answer is the title of the book. And we don't know what nobody sent. We don't want nobody. 
nobody sent. Okay. These are the classic rules of the game of traditional Chicago politics. Okay, so if we start with that, no. no I was just gonna say, I didn't know this was a Hyde Park Democratic Party. Yes. I mean, I, that, I, I was always under the assumption that the Hyde Park board was one of the few yes. areas which Go ahead and finish. Oh. Yeah. That the fifth ward, I believe, which is Hyde Park, was always one of the few one of the few wards in the city which was consistently anti-machine and independent. So I'm surprised that uh, this would be a official, even here, in this ward, would still be uh, operating under the same basic principles as the rest of the city. Yes, I agree. You're, what you say is 100% true. But the organization, when I read the book, is what they told me. <laughs> So they're, um, where the party would have its offices and activities and what they did, um, I'll, I'll just cite one other case as, as an answer to your question. Um, the, the, um, when Barack Obama, oh, let me get this, let me get this one. Um, The, um, I, I don't want. I don't want to mix too too many too many anecdotes at once. I'll I'll, I'll just leave it leave it leave it at that. Uh, <coughs> but you're right. The voters. That's that's the general view. Nevertheless, be be careful. The majority of of, of Hyde Parkers are of what ethnic background? African Americans. You don't know a lot of them in these classrooms. But the majority of Hyde Park voters are African American, and they're probably closer to the guy he was talking to. Okay, get him in now. Uh, <coughs> the, um, what, I'm, what I'm briefly sketching is just the, the transition from, di from daily one to daily two, and then moving up to present. Basically, we had clientelism the books as summarized in the quotes, the, the style of daily one. Um, there were a couple of, well, basically, Harold Washington fought against the incumbent was Jane Byrne, and said, "We will bring reform," and he and he basically tried very very hard to do so, attacking the the, the uh, party style. I'm trying to summarize, but give you that. I mean that one big point. The the. The policies then gave largely structure. Harold himself would go to um, many um, Chicago symphony, ballet, other kinds of artistic performances, but this was not covered in the press, even though he was a fan of all kinds of, of, of um, art. I even, I said to him, you know, nationally, we, we've got some new numbers which are showing most citizens really want, there are more citizens in the U.S., I told him, who, who go to concerts than go to baseball and basketball and football games. I mean, I think he even answered, not for me, but basically, even, I'll, I'll say for you, it is true for Chicago as well as nationally, although you don't. You never know that from the Tribune and the Sun Times. Okay. The um, um, and the, the the mayors regularly go to the football games, the best, and 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 the, and the press are there covering the mayor, shaking hands with with the players. Whereas you don't, Harold Washington didn't want to be photographed going to a ballet. Okay. Um, <coughs> with Daily Two. With 
Maggie Daly, Mrs. Daly too, things changed. Maggie Daly and, and uh, or really was, the, was what was the, the park near north of the north part of the loop is named the Mark Maggie Daly Park because she, 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 she was very important political in terms of these kinds of policies. Parks were big stuff. <coughs> Second, the cultural context <coughs> cultural into the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs was very smart, very active, and would take daily to go to meetings in Europe and see, hey, Paris is different from Chicago. We got nice bus stops here. The streets are clean. Hey, how do you get the streets so clean in Paris? He started to pick up some ideas like this, including the arts. And he didn't start it. This really came from Jane Byrne. Jane Byrne called it Chicago Fest. And it was sort of a takeoff on the German, uh, the German <coughs> uh, uh, festival. Uh, festivals at, at harvest time, but Chicago has now got four months of summer festivals, and these are, and I, I, have, I have argued that this, this is a major driver of the economy, the differential attraction and salience and self-definition of many of the civic leaders of Chicago has become arts-oriented. Uh, so the, the um, I'm not going to take the time, but we've got the numbers which show this. It's a huge increase in the city of Chicago funding for the arts. It's not called the arts. It's not called the budget of cultural affairs. Even though they've renamed Michigan Avenue, you know, who, who knows the name of Michigan Avenue for one mile south of the Chicago River? I'm trying to, most of you, it's okay. Most of you are not from Chicago. Most of you don't know any, any of this stuff which is why I'm telling you some of these descriptive but analytically important basics. And the mile south of Chicago River is called the cultural mile to balance the million dollar mile which is on the north side of the Chicago River. Okay, <laughs> so the cultural, and that cultural mile has the Art Institute, the symphony, several universe, several biggish universities, and then hundreds of little universities, and then one or two blocks away, there are roughly 40 to 50,000 university and college students. You didn't no notice a campus right there? You thought it was just the USC and Northwestern UIC? No. It's right there. These used to be abandoned warehouses that went bankrupt they couldn't pay their taxes, and so the city of Chicago took them over. So they then, daily had the idea, we could build up a new base for the economy, which could be arts, culture, students, intellectuals, and this kind of stuff. And it's worked. It's driving people, many of their middle, so anyway, I won't try to go into, into detail, but it, it is there, and <coughs> It was a policy in a serious way to support the arts, which Daly then did more actively. When, when they, why was he doing this? I had, I had two years in a row, I had two people who were the, the chief of the city of Chicago and the top civic, civic group subsidizing globalization, that, or that is, sponsoring, helping, analyzing, interpreting, linking globalization for, for trade, for business, for political presentations and so forth, for people to come to Chicago and to link Chicago to people who are buying and selling in Australia or in China or in Czechoslovakia and so forth. <coughs> the, the, um, I'm mentioning because of the title of this course, how do you link local and global? And this is how it happened. These, these two folks were here and they, so they'd give us a lecture and at the end, a discussion at the end, I'd, I'd say, how much does the, does the mayor listen to what you say? And the first year they said, oh yes, we, we, we listen to him. He, 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 we, we give him many, many ideas and he, and he listened. Came back the next year, I asked the same question. Wow, we make six, six proposals and he does 16 on his own. So he, he learned about Paris especially 
as the ideal world city for him. And if you look at the bus stops of Chicago all around, they're built, owned, maintained by a French company, still drives around the same, you know, same guy, I don't know if he speaks English or not. <laughs> doesn't matter, but it's a French company. And they have some big billboards along the freeways. But this, this, this company is, is, is the most successful French, they, they built the same thing in Paris and some of the big French cities. <coughs> but the point is this is one symbol of about 25 other things, such as planting Michigan Avenue with flowers all over it, people, so people continue to say, why are you spending the taxpayers' money to put flowers on Michigan Avenue? This is a waste of time and money. You knock on the same door and you knock on and, and you knock, knock in subsequent years. What is the strongest economic base, the economic foundation of this city today? What do they say? Or what did they say in 1900? Honestly, steel. 1900? <laughs> Livestock, cowboys, slaughtering the beef. 1930, it was 19, it would be steel and, and industry. 1960 or 70, it would be finance, the board of trade, options. The biggest option, the biggest option, the biggest mark, stock market was the New York Stock Exchange, and then London and, and others. But in terms of the US, New York, but for options, the biggest in the world, I believe, certainly in the biggest in the U.S. was Chicago. <coughs> and so, the the um, when we today, since Harold Washington, since Daly too, what is the the, the main found economic foundation of the city? Tourism and culture. None of those. Okay. Tourism and culture needs flowers, it needs a cultural model. Does it bring jobs and money to people who are African American in my neighborhood called Bronzeville? Are there poor people who get jobs and money from this? Absolutely. This is, this is where, you know, uh, what's, what's the largest source of revenue for the city of Chicago? Property tax? No. Sales tax. Huge sales tax, 9, 10, you know, 11 percent, et cetera. A lot of that money goes to fund the city of Chicago for poor people. The park district gets money, and they use the money for, they, that is, I told you a story about using the jobs and contracts traditionally were replaced by very active, quite successful um, programs where the the, the funding um, provide public park services for low, low, generally lower income people. Okay, um, so the, the quick point is drastic change from across these mayors over time. How did especially Daly too, who really implemented, I mean, Jane Burns started with Chicago Fest. But it exploded under Daily Two with more money, more more teams, more stages, millions of or hundreds of thousands of people coming here as tourists, cultural representatives, etc. Most of us in the summer when you're not here, most of you are not from Chicago. But in Chicago, sometime you know, read about it or look at the beginning of the end. Maybe you'll overlap a little bit. <coughs> uh, Lollapalooza is the biggest event. Um, and there are now 200, 200 variations of this around the world. Um, <coughs> okay, the, the um, um, so what I've given you are pieces of the new political culture from the arts to populism to breaking with the machine traditionally by, as illustrated by Barack Obama's building his national party base without the traditional democratic parties. And, and, and so the, 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 the two, if you look at the two, the two books basically, they're, they're, they have the same analytical framework, but one is based on comparing 7,000 cities in 20 countries around the world with little bits of cases 
whereas the other is one big case study, just Chicago, uh, with an oral history. So that the data came not from what I said. Bill, Gr I then so then I, I called up Bill Grimshaw, who was the, the campaign manager who started writing the the, <coughs> the speeches on, on reform. I said, you know, Bill. With Harold, you're going to transform the whole set of rules of the game of, of Chicago politics. This is going to mean the, the, all those books are going to have to be redone. Yeah, well, how how could you sa you know save some of the save save some of the documents? What you're doing? So he said, I'm I, I'm too busy, Terry. Hung up on me. I called him back a month later. I said, Bill, this is you know, this is really big stuff. And he said, Well, listen, I have one condition. Uh, I'll do this if you'll do one thing. I said, What's that? do it with me. So that's how I got involved with Harold and with the people. And so I was, I was down there working in City Hall, you know, twice a week until midnight, writing stuff and, and um, seeing how things worked inside, <laughs> okay. Joining with the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Okay, so the, <laughs> the and, and I'll just say it for example, in one office you could have th two people here who work for Jane Byrne and they wouldn't give any pencils to anybody else who's working for Daly or someone else who's working for our Washington. These three different branches were found in many of the offices in the city, and they, they each were continually fighting to be the next mayor. Okay, so finally, uh, after Harold, Harold died, after a year after the beginning of his second term, so he's four, 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 well, just over four years, Daly to, Daly to uh, Soon, soon became mayor. Um, the the um, I want to I want to try you just to show you a very brief view of um, daily one. Or, or uh, let me let me pause for a minute. Questions, comments on what I've said? Any stuff? Okay. Let me let me show you a, just a quick picture of daily. Um, In the heat of emotion and riot, some police, policemen may have overacted, but to judge the entire police department by the alleged action of a few would be just as unfair as to judge our entire younger generation by the action of this mob. I would like to say here and now that this administration, our administration, and the people of Chicago have never and will condone brutality at any time, but they will never permit a lawless, violent group of terrorists to menace the lives of millions of people, destroy the purpose of this national convention, and take over the streets of Chicago. Okay. What was he talking about? You all should know this. Vietnam. No. <laughs> More than just beautiful dance. It's a touch of the divine. More than just legends. It's the beautiful culture and okay. In 1968 Democratic Party convention. Had demonstrations, activists from Berkeley and from New York and wherever came to Chicago and they said we would like to be admitted to the Democratic Party convention when we vote on who will be the presidential candidate. And we want to be part of that discussion. And Daly was the chairman of local affairs, local local responsibilities, and he called the Chicago police and they they said, you know, no. And they said, well then, you know, we're gonna push our way in. And so they fought with the police and the police carried them away. And the TV, the national television people were there, and it was covered all over the U.S. And Chicago had many organizations which said, 
we're never going to have a professional meeting in Chicago because of that mayor. So it got it totally transformed him and the and the um, city in its in its self definition. So I want to show briefly that and so and Daly was considered the most important mayor, often creative um, mayor mayor in the United States at, at the time, as as did his son when, when he was here. Okay. So that, that's a background. Let's look now at, a, at, the, at this former mayor of Milwaukee, Norquist, whose book is on the reader, reading list. And I'm going to show from roughly 29 to 32. So can we get this here? I said, well, I didn't ask you to do, you know, but it was just like, it's so negative. So we started to figure out how do we fix stuff? So, uh, uh, and I'll get more into that later. I want to just go through some images and get that done. We, we took out the freeway and that was the plan we put in place. And there's, there, there are more than twice as many people living in downtown now, about 15,000 people living very urban thing, and it's it's still growing even though we're in the middle of a recession, we're still going, going on. We went from two developers who had a, their hand out asking for subsidies to 33 developers, almost all of which didn't get subsidies because we planted and zoned the city to make it uh, easier to develop. And this is, I just want to go through these road pictures and we'll get back on the other subject. But this is the most dramatic redo of a city is Seoul, South Korea. And it, right after the Korean War, this double-deck freeway was built over the river. Uh, they went right through the middle of Seoul. And in 2001, they decided to take it down. By 2003, they were done. They did it. They put in streets with just two moving lanes in each direction to replace a freeway that carried 150,000 cars a day. And that's what it looks like. Billions of dollars of real estate value. The guy who did it, there he is. Lee Von Bach, who's now the president of South Korea. But he was really happy when he was mayor, you can see it in the picture. He had the guts to do the right thing. And uh, you know, he was, oh, but if we do that, it might not work. Well, he went ahead and did it, and it did work. And you know, sometimes you have to do things that seem a little counterintuitive. In Seattle, they, they have the Alaskan Viaduct right on the waterfront. And the, we met with the governor's people, and she's, her people said, uh, you know, Seattle's a big city. You can't take that out of there. There's no way to do the traffic with it gone. And uh, they said, well, that's interesting, because if you go 200 miles north, there's Vancouver. It's about the same size. And they don't have, they don't have the freeway. They, in the whole city. They don't have one freeway in the whole city. And they have the most buoyant real estate market in Canada. Um, but let's give them one. You know, so we photoshopped one in there. <laughs> or give it to Paris. You know, that's a big city and they don't have freeways. Maybe they should have one too. You know, I mean, it's really absurd to think. Here's uh, Brisbane, Australia, and they're planning on taking this out now because it actually creates traffic jams wherever the, the ramps are, wherever the nodes are. And it, it, in traffic, if to understand traffic, um, it's useful, I think, to look at wetlands, which we tried to conquer for 200 years of our country's existence, to conquer the wetlands, reclaim them, the Bureau of Re Reclamation. And now we know that wetlands actually have a value, a lot of value, you can start you can, the list goes on and on, but just for starters, it slows down the flooding. It absorbs water. It's a setting for plants and animals. It's a, a great place actually to do real estate development if you get on the edges of it away from the actual wetland. 
it really works well. After people figure out that the bats and the birds and everything eat all the mosquitoes anyway, so you, you don't have to worry about that. Um, so we don't do this much anymore. We don't pave the streams. It still can happen, but when it happens, everybody knows it's the wrong thing to do. So the okay. Well, with with um, let me just give one or one or two minutes of what he did before that, um, and what he would do. I mean, agriculture is important. You can do agriculture in your window at home. In the, in the city, you ought to think about ways to do it. Gardens are good. Backyard gardens are good. Community gardens are good. But uh, don't let a trend become the entire identity. Farm markets are good. In fact, uh, our next Congress of the Expressway. So it would have gone right where the St. Louis Cathedral is in Jackson Square. That would have had a big double-decker freeway right next to it. But they did build the Claiborne one, maybe because the neighborhood didn't have as much power as the French Quarter did. And that's St. Bernard, the circle at St. Bernard. That's the way it looked from the air. So, but this is America. We can make huge mistakes, but then we can fix them. And we that's been the case throughout our country's history. So we're working on it. Just putting it back, maybe putting it back better, making some improvements as well. Uh, and we're working with the city of New Orleans on this and the Treme neighborhood associations. Um, and so we're hoping that it comes back. Another city where these ideas uh, were visited was in Detroit. And Detroit was the most successful city in the world in World War II at producing, um, it was the most productive city producing war material. Uh, then Detroit not only helped the American Armed Forces win, but the British and even the Soviet Union got you know tanks, and planes, and jeeps, and ammunition, and all kinds of stuff from, and a lot of it came from Detroit. So anyway, we won the war, the Germans lost. Okay, okay that, that's our overview. Couple more minutes. The, the 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 big point. We don't have a single simple oral thing, but it, but he says it's very clear in the book. He, he and he came. He, he was a, he's a great speaker. He came to came to my class. And and uh, if you if you hadn't known that he would, had been there, it's a little bit like this. But he mostly had Renaissance Italian cities and churches. See how the view between those buildings is, is just right? So we don't want to have it a little further to the right because then the shadow would interfere. So the aesthetics was a major driver behind the wetlands and destroying the freeways. Instead, we want to have flowers and pedestrians walking. People make it people. Okay, if so if this came from him, his ideas also were reinforced by what was called the new urbanism. We, we ain't, anything okay here, Stella? Mm -hmm. the, the, um, the, new, the new urbanism was developed really at Yale. There were a couple of graduate students <coughs> who were in planning and history and, and um, I guess they call it forestry, but it's actually part of sort of a planning department. <coughs> The three of them got together and they had a huge impact on planning and architecture around the world. And they called, they call, it's called the New Urbanism. And they had a, called a conference, a national conference of, of New Urbanism based in Chicago. And they needed an executive director and guess what his name was? Norquist, you just heard him talking. So his job, when he, when he left Milwaukee after a couple of terms, he managed this international organization to go to South Korea and so forth, meet with these people internationally to do these kinds of things, as well as the taking the aesthetics of Renaissance cities, which basically elevated the art, not just being inside a church, but which influenced the ways we think about we live and we see ourselves and our cities through 
an aesthetic view of what's attractive. And so beauty is one of our 15 dimensions of scenes that some people, some of the time, talk about it, think about it either implicitly or explicitly. Not just in women's clothing magazines, but in city government, and major, maybe it's a driver of the economy of the city of Chicago. Not just slaughtering bulls and making financial option decisions. Okay, so <coughs> the, uh, one minute. Theaster Gates, innovative artist, developer in Chicago. Take a look, take a look for yourself at the, and, and a bit, and he's a fantastic entrepreneur. Uh, <coughs> he, he has humor, irony, teasing, it's a great story. If you look at this, it makes wonderful videos. The best one is still a story from the New York Times Magazine, um, Sunday, Sunday Magazine, and <coughs> um, and it, it, he talks about Theaster wanting to have to. I want to get to know Noah's Ark is waiting for me in Lake Michigan, but I don't know if I can get through the gunfire in the streets to get from here over to there, but I'll, I'll do the best as I can. And I'll, I'll, I'll pray for myself. <laughs> okay, so he, he'll mix street, smarts, teasing, the Bible, Noah, etc., in ways that he's not following the official rules of any one of these, but he's inventing his own combination. Uh, and he, he's, he's been labeled labeled. He won as a prize the most innovative and influential artist in the world in the Italian meeting of artists a couple of years ago. <coughs> um, Biennale. Okay. Questions or comments? Those of you who are saving up. <laughs> One minute. One thing that I've tried to say is we want to help you see the irony, the fun, the entertainment yourselves in this course and as Theaster does beautifully. You see it as well in Norquist. I mean, with the I mean, showing the mayor with his feet bent in the stream. So you know, he clearly enjoyed himself as mayor. Well, <laughs> he, he wasn't only smiling some of the time. He was a very uh, conflictual president. But that won't go, in, go into the Korean politics. But the, but the well, I'll just I'll let's make this a simple point. Seoul has been the most important city in the world in terms of numbers. You know, billions of dollars they've spent not only in Seoul, but nationally, to transform the whole country moving in the, these kinds of directions. Um, and China is, China and Japan are now all looking at each other and borrowing ideas from each other with the, with the, 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 the rock bands, the, 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 the K-pop subsidized partially and entrepreneurially highly successful globally is redefining the city in, 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 in terms of its ethos as a pop uh, kind of place, but one where people laugh and can enjoy uh, gang mong. <laughs> uh, okay. We are at the end of class. Thank you. And do post think. Remember about you're welcome to post things. Um, on canvas and um, they can count along with praise and everything else. <coughs>